Alrighty, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. And this is an educational channel where we take a look at um, some of my favorite theories of everything. Uh, usually uh, things that you don't really uh, know about unless you've been doing a lot of digging. Uh, the obscure variety of theories of everything, but things that uh, would really help you put things together, help you get the big picture, help you see holistically uh, if you actually did know about them. And so today is uh, the 277th video that we've done on the reciprocal system of theory. And this is a theory from Dewey B. Larson, uh, who first got his um, inspiration uh, on this, the reciprocal system back in about the 1930, about 1930, and uh, gradually uh, kept his day job and gradually at night uh, kind of chipped away at his, uh, his epiphanies and uh, by the late 1950s was able to put out his two fundamental postulates. And um, then from there, he, he put out his two fundamental postulates and he used a process of deduction to deduce an entire theoretical universe from those initial postulates. And he wrote uh, many books on his discoveries, uh, books on chemistry and physics and astronomy and also economics and uh, metaphysics, including philosophy and religion and psychology and biology. And uh, unfortunately, he died in 1990 uh, at the age of 92. So he, but he did have 30 years of you know, solid book writing that he put in. And then um, after his death, uh, he, a few of his uh, followers, he had a very small group, but a few of them have uh, kept the faith and uh, have uh, continued to um, evolve his theory, to develop his theory, to expand his theory. And one of those is Dr. Bruce Perrette. Uh, and Dr. Bruce Perrette uh, also unfortunately passed away back in 2020, but uh, he had a long uh, period there where he was uh, putting out a lot of content mostly on one, on one of his three websites and uh, some articles too. And he also uh, wrote uh, what's called the Daniel Papers. Um, that was kind of his uh, pseudonym, Daniel Phoenix 3. And he wrote that, those articles when he was speculating a little bit on the reciprocal system. But he came up with, uh, along with Dr. KVK Nehru, uh, from India came up with what he calls RS2, the reciprocal system 2. So it was a reevaluation of the reciprocal system, uh, taking the spirit and the uh, most of the findings of the reciprocal system, but um, working out a few of the kinks and uh, extending it into other fields using other uh, understandings that they had um, to augment uh, what Larson had come up with. Because uh, after all, if you have a theory of everything, um, usually it's going to uh, be the same as somebody else's theory of everything, but you're just using different language to express the same thing. And that's what Perret found, particularly with the Taoist uh, yin-yang system, uh, uh, a lot of the Pythagorean, ancient Pythagorean system, uh, Perret was really trying to draw a lot of parallels between those and Larson's reciprocal system. Also, projective geometry is something that Perret used a lot. He used a lot of Jungian psychology, um, symbolism, a lot of mythology, and uh, some of us. Uh, you know, dissident astronomical findings as well. So he puts together a very interesting body of work along with uh, Larson, or kind of after Larson. Uh, the basic idea behind the reciprocal system is that 
We don't live in a universe of matter. And we don't even live in a universe of energy. But we live in a universe of motion. Matter and energy are just two different kinds of motion. And motion is characterized by the relationship between space and time. For example, speed. Speed is uh, one of the most basic motions that we can think of. And speed is measured in miles per hour, usually. The car is moving 20 miles per hour. 20 miles of space in one hour of time. And uh, so that is, in fact, a reciprocal relationship between space and time. Because if you multiply the space, if you multiply the speed by two, then you would say the car is moving 40 miles per hour. But you could also say that the car is moving 20 miles per half hour. You can either multiply the space or divide the time. That is a reciprocal relationship. And um, Larson found that really all scientific quantities were simply different varieties of motion. And they were all relationships between space and time. But that space and time had a few caveats that you had to recognize before you could really uh, grasp that. Uh, one is that space and time are coordinate, meaning that they both have uh, aspects that are three-dimensional. And then space and time both have what Larson calls their clock aspects. They have uh, they exhibit a scalar motion, which is a motion that has a magnitude, but it has no particular direction, like a clock. A clock is always getting later and later and later. It's always moving later and later and later, but it's not moving in any particular direction. Another way to envision that is using a balloon with dots on it. You blow up the balloon and all of the dots are moving away from each other but in no particular direction. That is the flow of space. As time is always getting later and later and later, space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. And then uh, the third caveat is really that um, space and time are both quantized, meaning that they have a minimum unit. And if you don't have that full minimum unit, then you don't have space and, uh, or, and or time. Uh, so uh, they're not continuous. There is no, you know, decimal points. You either have one or you have none. And then from there, you either have two or you still have one. And from there, you even have either have three or you still have two. You have to have a whole unit before you have something. And if you have um, w one unit of space in one unit of time, that is the speed of light. Space over time is speed. One unit of space in one unit of time is the speed of light. And Larson calls that unit speed. Uh, one over one equals one. And... Uh, so, in Larson's system, unit speed, or one, is the midpoint of the universe, or the neutral point of the universe, whereas most, uh, most uh, co cosmologists or most physicists, uh, they think of the universe as uh, the neutral point of the universe being zero, zero speed, and you count up. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, or you can count down minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. But in Larson's system, it's a universe of motion. So there is a motion that is always existent. Um, and that is the, min that is the midpoint. Um, not zero, but one. So that creates a multiplicative system where on one side you have two, three, four, five, and on the other side you have one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth. So it's a, a multiplicative system rather than a, an additive system 
like the uh, legacy scientists would say. And, you know, uh, uh, that's evidenced by Einstein saying that, Einstein said that the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. Larson is saying that the speed of light is the minimum, uh, I mean the midpoint of the universe, and that there is an entire half of the universe that's moving faster than the speed of light. And then there's the familiar half that Einstein knew of that is moving slower than the speed of light. Um, and so he basically, that's the, that's a long version, a semi-long version of the first postulate. His second postulate is simply that the universe conforms to the uh, relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its magnitudes are absolute and its geometry is Euclidean. Uh, even Dr. Perret disagreed with the idea of the uh, Euclidean geometry and really the commutative mathematics. Um, and so the second postulate is kind of in a state of limbo right now. Perret really said that the uh, geometry of the universe is actually projective geometry and that Euclidean geometry is merely a subset of the projective geometry. It's a small, um, uh, you know, a small component of a, a projective geometry. So Larson wasn't wrong in including Euclidean geometry, but he wasn't inclusive enough. And uh, so, what we're doing today is we are, uh, I believe this is the sixth episode that we've been reading uh, Dr. Perret's uh, paper here that's called Time and Timelines. And here we kind of learn about uh, basic aspects of time. Again, this is written uh, by Dr. Perret under the pen name of Daniel Phoenix 3. And uh, Daniel Phoenix 3 is indicative of his position as a member of this Phoenix 3 project, which uh, was, uh, I guess, an umbrella term that also included the Philadelphia experiment and the Montauk project, which was a top secret black ops government um, a time travel project that occurred in the early 1980s and uh, went uh, very badly awry. Uh, and um, you may have uh, heard or read interviews or books from uh, Al Bielik or Duncan Cameron or Preston Nichols or others about this uh, Philadelphia ex uh, experiment, this time travel experiment. Um, but Dr. Pret also puts in his two cents about what happened. Now, I don't know 100% for sure if Dr. Pret is, is writing from personal experience or if he's, um, you know, taking some liberties and really just writing science fiction. Um, but he has an interesting perspective anyway. So if you want to start from the beginning, you would want to go back to... Um, about five videos ago um, and start there and listen to all those videos from there but um, uh, we will start let's see okay he was talking about coordinate time again that's the three-dimensional time we ran into a lot of trouble uh, trying to deal with the cosmic sector, Larson's name for coordinate time, as all interaction with it, no matter how precisely calculated, would have random consequences. As it turns out, coordinate time is not this empty void that the 19th century ether researchers led people to believe. It is an entire universe unto itself, with stars, planets, and life. You know, this is like what Larson says, the cosmic sector or the uh, the half of the universe that's moving faster than the speed of light is is an entire half of the universe it's not just uh, this kind of uh, little subset the shamans of ancient tradition were fully aware of the etheric life uh, in this coordinate time realm they developed skills to actually see them and their interactions with people 
Many of the lower life forms are parasitic in nature and are attracted by a person's chi, tasty food. We eat food to build energy. They eat energy to build form. They are attracted by strong emotions, particularly the negative ones such as fear, which is abundant at Montauk. It was the presence of these temporal entities that messed with a lot of the calculations, though we were pretty much unaware of it at the time. If we realized it, we'd probably have called an, in an exorcist or two. We knew something was going on that appeared random in nature, the movement of these etheric life forms, but did not have a good understanding of the realm we were punching a signal into nor that there might be non-corporeal forms living there. In the Montauk literature I've read, it was said that Duncan Cameron summoned a creature from the id, a monster from the unconscious. Well, our unconscious is the consciousness of coordinate time, since they are reciprocally related. What Cameron actually summoned was probably one of the etheric life forms akin to one of our great apes and pulled it through sufficiently that it could directly interact with physicality and destroyed the base. Once all the trans, uh, transmitting equipment was destroyed, I think Preston Nichols did that, but I wasn't there that night. Uh, that entity moved back into phase with his own realm and disappeared from ours. But that kind of energy signature will leave footprints. People are still seeing some strange things out at that point, at, out at the point, Montauk Point, uh, from lobster boats. And that Montauk Point is way out at the end of Long Island, New York. Okay, this section is called uh, After 20 Years. Have I, as I've mentioned frequently, the people running the Phoenix 3 project really did not have a clue as to what they were doing. It was usually trial and error, mostly error. They had some advanced technology that was billed as foreign technology to make you think it was Russian or Chinese. But even Russian and Chinese technology is based on the same physics that everyone is taught in school. This stuff did things that was out of this world. And obviously it was. When they'd start talking foreign tech, those of us down at the bottom of the ladder would just look, each, look at each other with that, yeah, anything you say expression. None of us really had a clue of the larger picture as we would only work on sections of projects. But with all the information that has come out since those times, a larger picture can be assembled from the pieces. Some of the things that we did is that there are two different kinds of technology that is in use. The electromagnetic technology we use today comes from the SMs, or the Saurian men, or the spacemen, uh, basically the re reptilians. There is also a different kind of technology that is used by the enemies of the SMs, the LMs, or the little men. Um, and the little men he usually uses to refer to uh, the beings from mythology, the fairies and the elves and the sprites, um, and, uh, you know, the knock, those kind of... Uh, those kind of creatures that come out of mythology. Um, they have a mechanical technology that is similar to the vibratory physics people discuss with ether theory, in, particularly, in particular the research of John Worrell Keeley. The two technologies tend to be mutually exclusive. They stop working in the presence of each other. There was also a great deal of difficulty with LM technology, as man does not have the physical senses to interact with it properly. You would pick up a rock and say, that weighs two pounds. Um, 
let me uh, let me just go back here. Uh, he's got a footnote here. Um, the LMs are another intelligent species native to Earth, abundant in legend and mythology as elves, sprites, and pixies. Referred to these days as Lemurians, not Lemurians, but Lemurians, a word that means people of the sea. Water babies on the west coast of America, or the knock in Scandinavia. Um, and then he says, uh, John Keeley had a difficult time keeping his technology working because he was building it during the Industrial Revolution and surrounded by incompatible technology. Also, the majority of current research into vibratory physics is operating under a misconception. Uh, as mentioned in the geoengineering paper um, that he wrote, that Perrette wrote, uh, they got it backwards. Most of the tuning required to get vibratory, a vibratory device operational is to introduce, I'm sorry, to neutralize vibration, not to create it. Like Keeley, LM technology is based on the neutral center. And uh, if I would just piggyback on that, it would seem like that neutral center is like the outward motion at the speed of light uh, that Larson says is the neutral point of his reciprocal system, unit speed. Okay, one of the LMs, okay, back to this, um, the whole sentence here. You would pick up a rock and say, weighs about two pounds. One of the LMs would pick up a rock and say, it's a B flat. Their sensory organs work differently than ours. Our physical senses are more along the lines of the race we have a genetic similarity to, the SMs. We can utilize SM technology easily, but LM tech would be better relegated to singers and musicians as it deals more with the cosmic coordinate time aspect of things. SM tech is purely spatial, which is why it was the preferred technology for the Phoenix projects. Now, I would, I would uh, push back a little bit on what uh, Perrette is saying there. Uh, just, he says the, our, we don't really have the sensory organs to work with uh, work with music. Um, I wouldn't say that. I would just say that it, our sensory organs are not developed in terms of being able to work with music in, in the same way that they are with working with uh, SM technology and that we could overcome that barrier if we worked on it a little bit. If we became, just like he says, singers and musicians are able to deal in that, in that realm um, but they, they have a lot of training. They've had to practice. So I don't think it's out of our range or out of our reach. It's just that um, we have to uh, enlarge our reach. Okay. Um, to understand these technologies, one must first be acquainted with the concepts of three-dimensional coordinate time. Creating a universe... Uh, of its own, and that universe exists concurrently with our own three-dimensional coordinate space realm. It is not a parallel reality or tucked away in some far corner of the universe. It is right here, right now, just shifted out of phase with our spatial reality so our physical senses do not detect it. However, our non-physical senses can detect it and operate within it, which gives rise to uh, what is called psychic ability. Um, okay, we are close to the end of this paper, but uh, there's a, a, a very meaty section here at the very end, and so we will uh, pick that up uh, tomorrow, uh, probably read over this par same paragraph again, and then start uh, with kind of the, the general... Um, the manifestations of working with uh, three-dimensional coordinate time. Um, 
the different uh, so-called uh, psychic powers that you would gain from working with um, coordinate time or LM technology. All right, uh, thank you for tuning in and have a great day.